started really quickly with some general housekeeping information, everybody, while people are getting signed in. And then I'll pass it over to Jackie to introduce the presenter for today, and then we'll get started. So, again, I mentioned I'm Robin with GFAS, and I want to thank you all so much for being here. I really quickly want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. First, in order to mute your phones, because a lot of times background noise can get really distracting, um, you'll notice over on the participant page on the right-hand side of your screen, if you click near the your name, you want a microphone there. And if you have a microphone, if you click on it, it will go red, which means you're muted. You can mute your phone or... Um, on your computer, but the easiest way is to click that microphone. We do have a couple people that are listed as call users, which just means they aren't recognized by a name at this point. They may have signed in and not used the participant number they called in, which is no big deal. But those phone lines, I'm going to mute on my own because you can't mute those because you don't know which one go with your name. Um, so if you have questions, if you're having technical difficulties, Please the chat in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. I can definitely help you out. Jackie can help you out. We'll answer any of your questions there. Um, if you do have questions during the presentation or best, please feel free to type those questions into the chat box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And Jackie and I will periodically throughout the presentation pass those questions along to her. Don't get to your question right away. Don't worry about it. We definitely have made a note of it. Keep it also that best has um, made time at the end of the presentation specifically for Q&A. So we may hold some of them till then, but if you have a question and you're thinking about it, please feel free to type it in the chat. Um, the best is more than happy to take any questions during the presentation, so please feel free to do that. I also want to mention we are recording this session. Great right about that is you'll be able to go back and view the information again if you'd like, or if you have other members of your organization that you think would benefit from it, they can view this information also. What one is after this presentation is over, once the recording has been put on a website, you'll get an email either from Vector or from myself until the recording is available and should get a link. link. Go to that link. It will probably require you to sign in, which means you may have to set up with WebEx a username and password. But you can access the recording and you can also access the documents that I emailed to you this morning. If you didn't so don't worry at all. They are on the website for you to download. They include a PDF of the slides as well as two other documents that Beth has graciously shared with all of you that I think will be very helpful to your organization. So before I pass this over to Jackie, just want to mention again really quickly to mute your phone lines over on the right hand side of the screen where you see the participant list. If you find your name and kind of hover over your name, you should see a microphone, and if you click it, it will go red, and that will mute your phone, which has any background noise. Um, if you just joined us, if you have questions during the presentation, yes, please read the those into the chat box, and we will periodically pass those along to her. So I'll pass this over now to Jackie to go ahead and introduce your presenter for today. Sure. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm really happy to announce our webinar and our presenter, Beth Foley. Um, as you know, the GFAS standards cover a number of topics on governance, financial management, and financial stability, including establishment of operating reserves. I know I've gotten a number of questions about this, and as I looked at the information, I realized how much there is to learn about developing a policy and a strategy for reserves. Actually, I was introduced to Beth, who's probably one of the best speakers you can find on this issue. Beth is a nonprofit finance specialist who has provided her expertise to a range of organizations in the deep area and elsewhere. She is chair of the Nonprofit Operating Reserves Initiative Work Group, which is a group of very talented and experienced individuals in the nonprofit arena. The work group has developed a toolkit, which is only one of the resources I know Beth is going to discuss today. And she has a lot of material to cover. I'm going to turn this over to her, but I just wanted to say thank you again for her time and for agreeing to give this presentation to us. Hi, Beth. All yours. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. I'm not sure where you are, but um, it's o'clock in the afternoon here in D.C. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about, um, let me see if I can get this to advance. Here we go. The agenda. Um, why are we talking about operating reserves? And we're going to touch on how 
to talk about why you have your reserves. Uh, we're going to talk about defining what operating reserves are uh, in terms of what's available and where you live and just some technology to get you oriented. Uh, we are going to focus primarily on reserve policy development and then we'll uh, look at some practical applications such as reporting and communication and touch on investment considerations. And that's time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and as Jackie and Robin both mentioned, um, this, this slide presentation will be available on their website and, and all of the resources I'm going to be talking about today are available at this website that is listed in front of you. So why are we talking about reserves? Well, there's no news to any of us, but the research over the last four or six years has revealed that nonprofits are woefully undercapitalized. Um, the Nonprofit Finance Fund does an annual state of the sector survey, and the last one that we have, of course, was um, 2011, released in March, and these are the findings. I, I do have to say that they're slightly improved from the year before, where 61% had less than three months and 12% had none. So we're improving <coughs> in, in terms of health, but it's still that these years are not great. And makers are responding and paying attention to this issue. Uh, in, in January, Grantmakers in the Arts launched its uh, national capitalization project and, and uh, uh, because many um, arts groups have facilities, which I believe is an issue for some of you folks as well, they really uh, <coughs> put the organization more at risk for being un uh, poorly capitalized. And uh, groups in general are, are talking about it. I attended a conference in, in Southern California, the Southern California Grant Makers Conference, where they took an entire day uh, for funders to focus on how they could best help organizations uh, build balance sheets, and a lot of the discussion was on what kinds of funding could, could they actually fund reserves directly, or uh, should they move the focus away from their restricted grants and move it more toward unrestricted grants so that the organizations could determine their best to put their assets. So um, I come to be talking to you today because of an in initiative that started in in um, 2008, in the spring of 2008, b before even the crash happened in, in the latter part of the year, a whole lot of us, and there, there were about uh, 65 different representatives from the nonprofit sector, nonprofit leaders, grant makers, accountants, policy folks, researchers, consultants, and capacity building um, organizations. We're right around the table. Um, we can be at the Urban Institute and, and really began a deep discussion of, of our concerns over um, how fragile some of our most valuable organizations were. And we thought uh, after our first meeting that our objective would be to define operating reserves and, and to advocate for them. So uh, the result of the convenings were a white, our first result was a white paper where it really was a call to action, an advocacy piece, and a lot of language about why we need operating reserves. And then uh, the logical outcome of calling people to action was to provide some help for them to really do what we're asking them to do. So a subset of, group, uh, of the work group pulled together and focused for about it's about a year because we worked really hard on this. Uh, took this toolkit together as for nonprofits to um, develop their own policies. So uh, that's a little bit about the white paper and a link directly to the white paper. Um, and you know we're we're now launching into making the case for having the reserve. These are some of the topics that were discussed in the white paper. So we talked about what the statistics are. So we know there's evidence 
sense that we're to have operating reserves. There seem to be some misunderstanding between the word not for profit or non profit, meaning that you can't make, you can't have any surplus. But really, one of the pieces of education that we need to do, both among our board members and our funders, is to make sure that they understand that not for profit does not mean you can't have a surplus. And accumulated surpluses really are necessary for long term sustainability. Um, and that spending a penny really does lead the organization actually uh, on. Uh, and and vulnerable to things happen. We all know things happen. So it, the 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 case for this is that you want to be here in five years. You you don't want to spend every last penny as as admirable as that may seem. A case for having a reserve is again this ability to to continue to deliver on your mission. That um, it and in order to deliver on your mission, cash flow is a big issue. If you are have opportunity to have a reimbursal grant where you have to spend the money all in advance, not having a reserve may preclude your ability to do that. Having a reserve means that you can spend that money in advance when you know that you're going to be reimbursed for it. Having a reserve it does, in fact, promote long-term planning, mid-term planning, and short-term flexibility. Have reserves is a sound investment and make the organization look like it is a sound investment for donors and funders. So that's confidence, once again, that they're putting their money into an organization that is going to be there in five years. And a reserve is such a strong indicator of strong leadership on the, on the part of the board and the staff and their investment in sustainability for the organization. So, and have a reserve enables the organization to respond to program needs that come up and to take advantage of opportunities that come along that if you're stripped to the bone and living hand to mouth, you're not in a position to advance the mission you have that opportunity. And to say I'm sure some of you have experienced this when you're in, in a cash flow um, stress situation that it really, really does burn you out. And with the crisis of, um, there is a crisis identified by many organizations, many funders and researchers that leaders of organizations are using to leave Welsh organizations, um, I mean, the organizations that they've been leaders of for a long time because they are just burned out over the, the chronic cash flow issues. Um, again, a, you know, some boards of directors say we don't need an operating reserve because we can just get a line of credit. Well, a lot of it is a good management strategy, but I, I'm a firm believer in having both and having a strong policy for both and having a notion about <clears throat> which one of them you would use first. So, you know, there's uh, are aware of this, they're being more aware of this, and we need to be educators of our funders. I happen to know quite well uh, Rick Moyers here in the in um, C at the Agnes, uh, Eugene Agnes C. Meyer Foundation, and he has a blog. Uh, which runs on uh, um, a technical for philanthropy. Uh, it's it's a really good blog, and he talks about a lot of issues that pertain to nonprofit organizations and from the funder point of view. And he w he he's actually on our work group and is a strong advocate for reserves as well. The question is, can we afford not have an operating reserve? Before we delve into policy, I, I want to just uh, hit a baseline of, of cap structure here. This is a picture of your capital structure, and I often use this when I'm doing board orientations to um, help folks understand the 
Uh, most people are really uh, facile and understand the profit and loss, you know, money coming in, money going out. Um, but sheet is a little more mysterious to them. So what we're looking at here is, is, your, is a picture of the balance sheet. The bank equation assets minus liabilities equals net assets. And the reason we're talking about net assets is that that's where we focus on what's available uh, for uh, to create an operating reserve. So we look deeply at net assets um, here. Uh, we we have restricted, temporarily restricted, and permanently restricted, and, the, and those are the flavors net assets that were set up by FAP and um, AIPA to to stand as reporting for nonprofits. We are going to focus on unrestricted, because temporarily restricted and permanently restricted are donor um, restrictions that we really can't do anything about or do anything with except what the donor says. So, as we're talking about, is the unrestricted net assets that we can create our operating reserves from. Deep, uh, do a deeper dive into that. So here, here are our, our unrestricted net assets from the previous page. First thing we need to do to figure out what's available for reserves is to say to do what is available and what's not available. So what's not available are those things that you've um, invested in that are fixed assets. So, you know, land building equipment, you know, those, those things are not liquid. So we pull aside the non-liquid part of the net assets. And that leaves us with what's available. So these, again, are unrestricted and they're available for board designation. So. Sometimes boards will set aside um, a special purpose funds for various purposes. Um, those of you with facilities, you have probably given some thought to creating a special purpose fund as a building maintenance and repair fund or an equipment maintenance and replacement fund. Um, also, can set aside quasi endowment and of, of, of other um, board purposes. A, a nonprofit operating reserves initiative is really encouraging boards to proactively fund a board designated operating reserve, the, the amount of which is determined by a variety of factors, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And what's left over, so to speak, is what's undesignated there, and that represents your day-to-day -day working capital uh, that is that comprise both cash and some non-current, non-liquid assets such as uh, inventory or long-term receivables. So y you want to pay attention to how much you have in this liquid capital piece and supplement it with the um, operating reserves. And occasionally, if necessary, you can also access your credit to supplement that. So the available is the simplest definition of all of this. It's, it's all that stuff. If you just um, figure out what's available, that is the very first definition of reserves. And often, that's the definition that research they're using when they're coming up with these statistics about how, what the organizations have on hand. So it's it's actually not a very conservative number because it can include some liquid parts. Um, it's about what's available and the non-current um, Designated, I do want to um, stress is is an, uh, still unrestricted, so if the board designates it, it is free to undesignate it. So it's it's a way of lay, putting putting it aside at the board action, but can be released by the board to, for use. And, and here the, I'd just like to talk about a visual uh, when the nonprofit finance fund did a presentation at the California Grant Makers Conference. They had this. Beautiful visual image of a 
a bucket of water with spigots going into it. And if you imagine that the, it's our restricted funds, unrestricted funds, and, and temporarily restricted funds, um, that the restricted, the partly restricted, it turns on when you get a donation. The temporarily restricted turns on when you get a donation that is for for restriction uh, from restriction, so that you can use it. So it goes into the vat. And oh, I'm sorry, the permanently restricted one doesn't go into that vat, so you never get to turn it on. The unrestricted one, it flows into the vat or the bucket, and it just flows. Sometimes that unrestricted is receivable, so it comes into the vat in the form of ice cubes, but they actually melt and you can use them. And then they're, uh, they're in that vat of unrestricted is also a pile of rocks, and those are those solid, non-liquid pieces of unrestricted that won't be liquid, obviously, unless you sell them. And there's the board designated, which they characterized as a a clear water bottle, they still water and some water in it, and they put a cap on it. But the board is free to uncap it, to put the liquid into the bucket if it gets really, really low and you need that extra bit of liquid. So I, I thought that was a, a really good visual image um, for you know, taking, taking a look at what comprises this section here. So I wanted to talk just a moment uh, about the special purpose funds that uh, boards can set up as designated. Um, I work with some organizations here in DC who have who have these opportunity funds for their entrepreneurial founders uh, to to them up to try out, do pilot programs, grab opportunity, you know, try an idea without jeopardizing how the rest of the Norm operations are going, so so it frees them up to try these things out, and and it's uh, really that creative um, is of, of these wonderful leaders. That, that's that's a, a very good um, fun contemplate for a board. Again, you know the the organizational infrastructure pieces that we talked about before. Uh, I've seen organizations set up human resource capacity building funds. Uh, for instance, if you want to hire a uh, funding person, a new development person, the reason investment for hiring that person may not happen for 12, 16, 18 months while the person is developing their relationships with the various funders and donors. Um, but meanwhile, you still have to pay that person's salary. So developing a capacity building fund for human resource in advance to enable you to make that investment and not again not jeopardize the, the operations for the year or create a deficit that unplanned uh, is is one way to go. Special purpose funds could be for office moves for position. I mean, it it, it really depends on the organization's needs, but um, of course not that. I Operating Reserve Initiative hopes you will have a very high priority setting up the, re the operating reserve, but we do acknowledge that these special purpose funds are, can be quite important for organizations and also keeping an adequate amount of, of working capital um, here so that the uh, members of the organization have enough working capital to keep the organization going on a day-to-day -day basis without and dipping into reserves or or a line of credit. So we're looking at it, it, it deeply here. We advocate for funded reserves, we, which means that the reserve is liquid. It, it does not have within it, the, the, the designated reserve, that is, does not have within it non-liquid or long-term receipts or inventories or prepaids that, that are represented by cash that is, is reasonably um, easily accessed. And, and we do acknowledge that organizations with designated fund, uh, and funded observers all do need day-to-day -day working capital. 
designing the reserve, uh, what so, so we come up with, well, what's available and you know, how are we doing and what do we have available and uh, how do you calculate this, how do you express this? Uh, and it can be done both the percentage, uh, percentage basis or a number of months. So obviously if we're advocating for 25%, uh, that's about three months because that's one quarter of a year. So you take your operating expenses for the year and uh, divide that into available uh, to be served, and that's what's available. And if you're buying or trying to figure out what your operating reserve ratio should be, you make your annual operating and multiply that by the ratio. So if you decided that your organization had a lot of risk factors and that your uh, ratio should be 50 percent, your budget was 600,000, then you would want to have a board building a reserve of 300,000. So that's how the calculation works. And I guess this might be a good time to mention that one of the worksheets that's available to you um, is posted. There it is. There, there is a, a, a set of instructions for how it works, and it, it's a worksheet that is mainly uh, for to, to prompt discussion among you and you as managers, you as board members, uh, uh, to determine what the risk factors are uh, uh, that help you determine whether you need a lower or higher uh, risk ratio. Uh, so the NORI work group decided, although we do not want to put a benchmark out there that, uh, you know, uh, watchdog groups would use as a benchmark and be judging people around, uh, we, we use we nevertheless put out there that we think a good minimum operating reserve ratio to shoot for is, is about 25% or about three months of annual operating expense. But, you know, it depends. It really, really depends on what your organization needs and what is right for your, your organization. So we're be careful in, in all of the, the toolkit and the white paper to say this recommended minimum, but it depends. It really depends. It, it, it must be customized. There is no bench. We're not putting out a benchmark. So, how do you determine what the asset reserve is for your organization? We take into account some revenue volatility factors. How well is your spending? What governance of the organization like? What what is the culture of risk taking or conservatism? Um, how much programmatic or, or situational risk is there uh, for the organization? And then what is the organization's life cycle stage? Um, some and of the revenue volatility factors are covered in depth in the toolkit, and they're presented on that operating reserves ratio worksheet that I owed you, but, but these are some of the things that we um, that talk about. The fact whether you have a higher ratio or a lower ratio. So one of the primary ones, of course, is you know, how reliable are your funding sources? Um, how, what is revenue diversification? Do you have a lot of different funding sources or is it concentrated? Um, how are your cash flows? Do you have deep troughs, which would indicate that you might need a bigger reserve? Or is your cash flow pretty even and the and the thing of the grants coming in or the donations coming in or the fees coming in is very even and there's not much fluctuation? So those those are things that would affect um, whether you need a higher ratio reserve amount in your reserve or a lower one. Um, have around severe weather, um, you know, and especially late 
greatly. Economic health of the community factors very largely in it because the corporate contributions are, are being affected by the economy. Spending flexibility, sometimes fees are tied almost directly with the revenue, um, but uh, how flexible are you? How, ca how quickly could you downsize? How quickly could you respond to uh, changes in the environment? And, and what uh, what term commitments have you made that you can't get out of uh, in terms of leases and in terms of contracts with staff? And, and facility plays a very big part in this, or, or um, may do in, in the case of some of your organizations. Um, that do you have? These are, uh, these are some of the spend flexibility factors that you want to think about. Do we have a risk in this area? And if we do, what, what is the significance of that risk? In, in terms of how much we should set aside to deal with it if we have to. I, I, some of the governance and management factors, these are, these are also in that worksheet. Um, one, of, one of the ones I run into a lot is, is not so much that the, the board um, to spend every penny because usually the board is, it, it, it really likes having a cushion around, but the issues is that do our budgeting, we decide how much we want to spend, and we think how much we have to raise, rather than doing income-based budgeting where you budget for the income sources that you feel reasonably sure are going to happen, and then keeping the expense budgets within those. So a lot of those fundraising goals are quite hopeful. Um, to put it nicely, and and are not re the, and organizations will put their entire fundraising plan into the budget rather than have a separate plan that is maybe 25, 50, even twice as much as what they put into the budget. Recognizing the fact that you know not all that funding that you're for is going to come through. So uh, that that um, planning budgeting. Uh, Piece you need to really consider uh, in terms of behavior change uh, as you're doing the new budget, or take it in, into account as you're setting the reserve to cover shortfalls in that that mechanically happen with some of the uh, revenue targets in the budget. Jackie, we had a question come through, and it seems like a good point for it. Um, as you know, all um, working with animal sanctuaries, and when you're talking about the level of programmatic risk when you're making this assessment, we agree that the risk is high if you're carrying animals permanently. Uh, Understanding that's a lifetime commitment to the animals, hopefully. Exactly. So that so that's a, a spending flexibility factor. In my mind, because that is that really becomes a fixed cost, and uh, so it's a fixed cost if you intend to, uh, which of course you do, take that animal for its lifespan, or to respond to not being able to do that and the the cost of relocating um, that that animal. So so there are two pieces to that would tend to, in my mind, drive the reserve target higher so that you could res that, that you have reserve enough to take care of that animal for at least the amount of time that it might take to find other placement should that become necessary. Does that answer the question? I think so. If we get some follow-ups, we'll pass them along. Um, if it's a good time, we'll do it or we'll wait to the end. Thank you. Sure. So, so to, to kind of wrap up this discussion around how how much reserve to put aside, you have your spending uh, volatility and your revenue volatility factors. If if you have lots of money hanging around and 
and a real regular uh, income flow and very, very predictable uh, control expenses. You're, you're in good shape and, and maybe you need a lower level of reserves, but if there are risk factors either in own or fixed spending or then revenues uh, they need to, you know, be in this upper quadrant of a higher ratio. So as we did call everyone to action, um, we we that it's not enough to just set the money aside. That the board really needs to have a policy around how it's used. How came up with what they determined adequate reserve level to be. Um, how defining it, um, and how they talk about it, and how the fund is managed. So, as I said before, our the logical outcome of this call to action was to create this toolkit that would be uh, a resource for us to actually do what we're asking them to do. So, the work comprised representatives from these organizations that you're looking at, um, and, and I was actually on the toolkit workshop and uh, uh, work group, and we developed this uh, over the course of it, it, it took about a year to, to, to do it, um, multiple calls and lots of input and research. So uh, we we finally launched the, the the toolkit in September of 2010, and um, there's some of the component parts of the toolkit. I'm not going to dwell on this because I really, really want you to go there and look at what's in the toolkit. There are appendices that are in their native um, software so that you can use them. A couple of the pieces uh, are actually posted as a part of this presentation. And I hope you find them useful. And right now, you'll notice that my uh, email address and my telephone number, I think, are uh, a piece of the handout. I, I really would love to have any feedback that you have as you're using the tools. We are constantly trying to um, improve them and make them more user friendly. Uh, we we just um, post a, a new piece that is just a three pager because the toolkit is 78 pages and it's pretty technical. So it would be more useful for your CFOs or your accountants. You know, it talks uh, a, a lot about. Um, technical aspects of, of putting the together. Uh, so we we create a three-pager that is a, an intro that is some update from the white page, the white paper from 2008 or 2009, but, but this is recent. Um, and and it, I think it's a very good uh, introductory piece to throw on, on the board table if you're trying to open a discussion around starting a reserve if you don't have one. So the, the thing, as I said, that we wanted to focus on today with, with the presentation is this development of an operating reserve policy. So, and, and this is covered in the toolkit in depth. Um, we're we're um, thinking about it here as a list, list out from the toolkit. The sequence that you would go through is, first of all, in the case for the need for the reserve, and, and we've, we've that's what some of those rationales are. I think the board to agree that this is something that, that the organization wants and needs to do, um, and then using the toolkit and the reserve ratio worksheet and the outlines and sample language to, to actually develop the reserve. Uh, usually that's done by a subcommittee, either the this committee, or you could even set up a task force that would work on de developing policy and talking about actually sitting down around the table and filling out that ratio worksheet um, and answering some of these questions in yourselves. At the at the end of this uh, worksheet, you can um, let's see if I can get to the it oops it's up um, <laughs> stems around sorry. Uh, it, it adds up the the uh, score here and divides by the number of factors. It gives you a place to enter your own factors, which of course you know, the one it, it, it tool it, it, it can't 
customized to your needs, so here's an, an opportunity for you to put in your, your own needs. And does the d dividing to say, you know, what risk is. So if you fill this out and you land somewhere in there, in, in four to five, five, six, six, seven, then, you know, probably your organization is going to conclude that, that the mum 25% is the way to go. But if you're up in the eight, nine in consensus on, you know, adding these up and averaging them, they decide that it's six months or 50% is a more appropriate ratio, or even 70 to 100. Um, one of the folks on the work group was a representative of the Wise Giving Alliance from the Better Business Bureau, and said that uh, that he, he thought that that those weren't going to really worry or be concerned about uh, what there was unless it was over 100 percent. So there's it's a lot of room in there if you can come up with the rationales for what it needs to be at 60%, at 75%, at 150%. If that can be defended and you proactively communicate about that, um, no one is going to ding you on that. So um, it, it is an education process. It's educating your funders. It's educating your board. It's educating your donors. Um, and educating these uh, on the network groups about need for long-term sustainability, and they're all, you know, recognizing this as evidenced by then a comment that, it, that they start to worry until 200 percent. Uh, so, so the, in following the process, he drafts. Uh, get the board feedback, present the final draft, and then begin implementing it. In some cases where you from scratch, the 25% is not going to be achievable in, in a year or even maybe five years, but the, the impetus to figure out where you want to be and incrementally how you're going to get there. Because if you don't set the goal, um, unlikely that you ever will get there. So what are components of this reserve policy? Well, so it's a statement of purpose and philosophy. Why are we building this reserve and what are the objectives of the fund? And um, that I believe it's very important to have some history in the policy because remember the board members that are creating this policy right now and the Staff leaders that are championing this policy right now are not necessarily going to be there in 10, 15, 20 years when you hope that the policy is still in effect. So having having some uh, documentation within the policy itself about when it was established and what the opening balance was and what the original target amount was, uh, how was the real calculation, uh, what was that methodology that was used was included in the numerator, in the denominator, those kinds of things. Uh, because sometimes, uh, for instance, a an organization will have a large amount of in-kind contributions, which are non-cash expenses, that wouldn't necessarily impact on how high the operating cash reserve should be. So an organ some one organization might want to extract that that in-kind piece of its expenses be doing the division uh, to understand the ratio. So, and this is customized to your organization and its own circumstances and needs, which is all the more reason why I write down what the component parts are of the ratio calculation methodology is important. Then you get into the section about using the fund and replenishing the fund because the, the fund is, is obviously there to be used. So who has to access it? What authorization is given or required? Um, what communication methods? Can you use email? Can you use a fax? Um, is just a fun conversation enough? 
of, or not? Uh, who it, does the treasurer get to make decisions, or is it? A, it do you have to go the whole board? Um, there's a continuum of how uh, flexible or now the management of of the can be. And uh, I've seen organizations on one of the scale and the other, and we again it's what the organization itself and its board is comfortable with and with um, the re being reviewed on a regular basis. It may, you may start off with one level of flexibility and find that it doesn't work and then revise it. So you start with here is your first gen of it and practice and use will sometimes dictate that you need to change what these procedures are. It, it will be useful to define some technical terms if you're using technical terms. I really highly encourage you to use English um, and, and lay terms so that this that the uh, is likely to be very well understood by all of the users. Um, in imaging the, the fund, you, you do want to determine by position, not by name, who's responsible for managing it, where a separate bank account is required, uh, who open closes the account. A lot of times the policies won't, in fact, discuss what the accounting procedures are, but rather refer to a financial procedure annual that is separate from this that is a little more flexible, sort of more proceed in policy. Um, but I really encourage you to acknowledge that there are such procedures and that they should be in the course of setting up uh, the provision of the policy itself. So um, another piece that you want to address is is what the how liquid do these funds need to be and are there some set up of more or less liquid component of the reserve fund um, that you invested in a little more deeply based on what your projected cash flow needs are going to be. I also encourage you within the policy to lay out what the role of the Finance Committee is, um, how often they're going to review the policy, how often they're going to report to the board, and, and in what ways will they report to the board about the status of the reserve. So uh, the component parts of, of the reserve. Are, are there any questions? This is, um, this is a lot. I am going to click just briefly on this reserve policy development outline. I debated, um, and you can ask Robin and Jackie, I debated <laughs> whether to just provide the blank prompt version of this uh, or to the annotated version of this, but since the annotated version is available through the toolkit, I thought, hey, <laughs> let's just go for it. The, the risk I see is what, what I would like you not to do is to just copy and paste this and not put the thought into it uh, that will customize it for your organization because I can't stress enough Nori's position that this not one size fits all that the, what you determine as your adequate reserve is going to be different and for different reasons than any other organization on Earth. It's, it's yours. Of course, there are common themes and common needs, but the way you articulate why you have your policy is if you defend that to your funders and, and donors and help you to ask for their support in building it and maintaining it. So here are some examples of what other organizations have, have put as why they're establishing the reserve and, and what their objectives are. Um, some, uh, some other examples of what the target is, how they came about it, how they established the fund, when they did it. Um, so, so you can see there's uh, there are examples here 
but I really do encourage you to really through what your organization needs and your organization would answer these prompts. For for instance, the relationship um, here for, to oops, just keep saying all right. Uh, the the uh, commercial line of credit. Which did you use first? I'm totally ab agnostic on this. Uh, if there are many reasons why an organization might want to use the operating reserve as the last place you go, uh, or use the line of credit as the last place you go, um, I encourage you, especially while you have money, to negotiate a line of credit, even if you don't use it. Having it there, you know, is just another really strong management tool and another arson your sleep at night um, cushion because you know what's going to come up. Um, I'm with a group whose policy is to use the operating uh, the um, line of credit first before going to the operating reserves. You know, they have to pay some interest. They exactly when that big need for cash is going to be and exactly how long that's going to be. And they build it into their budget and preserve the operating reserve for deeper, more expected emergencies. So that's their decision. That That's right for them. It's not necessarily right for everyone. So I, I really do encourage you to have a discussion uh, as you're drafting this policy about which works best for your organization. Beth? Yes. I wanted to jump in and let you know, I like the five to ten minute mark left right now, and I know you've got enough slides still to go through. So if we run long, that's fine. But I want to, I'm, I'm holding questions to the end, so I'm just making notes as people have them. And um, if any happy that you can't stick around if we run long, in mind we will be recording this, and we will get you the link to the recording once it's ready enough. So I wanted to jump in with that. Yes. Great. I appreciate the, the prompts because you can tell I, I get so involved in this. It's one of my passions. So I'll, I'll, uh, I actually intended to move fairly quickly around the rest of the through the rest of the slides because we, we appreciate your passion. So <laughs> thank you. So okay, let's move on into practical applications. This uh, this is. Uh, a working issue for me, a communication issue. So if you saw this, and and this the way many audits show the uh, restricted net assets as one lump sum. So, you know, Cardinera says numbers in isolation are meaningless. Um, so what to tell about this organization? Looks like they have $4.3 in net assets. Yay. However, if we pull those apart and communicate adequately about them, and I apologize for the for the fly, um, you see that there are designated funds here, and there there are non-liquid funds, and that you know over the course of these five years, this organization has either deliberately or inadvertently dipped into some of of their designated funds. Um, that was not readily apparent by the way they were reporting it um, here in one lump sum. So, so we encourage you to proactively communicate about how responsible and prudent and wonderful you have been as leaders and and board uh, boards of directors of your organization to put aside these funds for the sustainability of your organization and to be transparent about what your assets are. Here are your non-liquid assets. Here's what's available for capital, as we spoke before. To build uh, reserves it include keep, having them a, a regular part of your operating budget, either budgeting for surpluses, um, budgeting uh, having it actually be a line item in your budget that you annotate and, and explain why you're doing it, uh, including it as a component in capital budgets and capital campaigns, 
um, in, include it as a choice for planned giving campaigns and to donate from specific sources such as falls or the Quest grants. It's a great opportunity where it doesn't disrupt or take away from your operating fundraising efforts to serendipitously build your operating reserve. There, there are non-budgetary uh, considerations in, in building and maintaining reserves, which is that you do need a staff leader and a board leader who are the champions of this um, to, to make sure that that it stays high on the priority list um, and 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 not fall to the wayside if you've set up a, a incremental way of funding it, you know, thousand dollars every year over the next five years to get to this magic place where we need to be. Um, easy to let that fall aside if you don't have committed leaders, you, you know, banging the drum and saying we really, really, really do need to do this. Um, cash flow forecasting as a part of your budgeting process, so doing a budget by month in addition to doing the line item budget will also help you see where your cash needs are going to be and will influence some of your cash flow decisions. The kit uh, has a very long section on, and very deep section on investing strategy, investment strategy. And I'm just going to quickly go through these slides. So you can see where here's your, your working capital up here. Um, you have operating reserves, which should be highly liquid. And then you may have long-term uh, funds and, and endowment. Uh, every once in a while, you may need to dip into the reserve, but you want to dip into the reserve um, at, in a way that is controlled and understood, and not be dipping into endowment or restricted funds, uh, which is not shown in this illustration, but um, it, it, it often is the case that uh, organizations dip into restricted funds because they don't have a clear delineation of and, and have their operating reserves as a, as a cushion in between there. The appendix uh, in the toolkit talks about these various levels of uh, liquidity and accessibility of, of cash. I'm, again, not going to spend a lot of time on that today, uh, but encourage you to go to the toolkit where you can see where these discussions around developing a cash investment policy are there, what the component parts of those are, what you, know, what you need to keep in mind as you develop your investment portfolio, and uh, what what a uh, cash investment policy might look like. And you know, I focused on the operating reserve policy, but having a, a cash investment policy to support is something we highly recommend and endorse. And there are a lot of sources in the toolkit to help, help you do this. If you look at this, this is sort of the visual picture of, of what you know our objective is you know, what it looks like to have your net assets and operating reserves be a bigger part of, of your capital structure. In summary, um, operating reserves and working capital, critical. Policy for managing these, also critical. Uh, having investment policies to, to safeguard and, and provide good stewardship, critical. And the tape is there to um, help you do all of this. So that is my presentation. <laughs> my, I'll get off my soapbox and let uh, you folks ask any questions that you may have. But before we do that, I just want to point out there's some great uh, resources that will also help with um, language around talking about your reserve, the rationale, uh, and uh, one in in particular, the um, Nonprofit Accounting Basics website. And full disclosure, I am a content provider, and uh, it's a really great place to get um, good basic accounting advice for, for free. Um, so, if if and and here are uh, the the three. that are available on 
the Nonprofit Operating Reserves website, this is our new three pager, which I encourage you to look at. Uh, H. Robin may, in fact, make available. So, so that's that's it. What questions do you have? Thank you so much, Beth. I do want to mention, and I've got a few questions. If anybody has others, please feel free to type those into chat. And if there is anybody that needs to leave while doing the Q&A, keep in mind that the piece of these slides as well as the two documents Beth showed you are on the WebEx site for this particular meeting. Uh, once the recording is up a little later today, you, will get, you should get an email, either from myself or from WebEx with the link. And if you just log into the site when it asks you to, you can access the documents as well as the recording. But if you have any trouble with them, feel free to email me. We can help you get in, let you know how to pass the link along to the recording for others also. I will make sure to email you all that information. So, and these, Beth, if you answered any of Beth, if you answered any of these questions during your presentation, let me know I'm sometimes responding to emails and working on text. That's not always hearing everything. So if you did already respond, please free to see, you know, we, we discussed this or you can elaborate. Um, but I had a question asking, what will you do if an organization's leadership staff at the director level is not supportive of having operating reserves? Yeah, well, I, um, I encourage you to uh, do some, about some scenarios. What, uh, okay, you're not, you don't want an operating reserve. What happens if that happens? What do we do if this happens? And and you know not, not some wild thing, but something that is plausible as the reason why that really feels that the organization should have a reserve. Uh, does, does that help? Of of course, you know you can pull out, you can look at some of these resources um, that, that talk about reserves. Um, and capital structure and sustainability, uh, in addition to the the documents, uh, this document which uh, iterates some of the rationale discussion that we had er early on in the presentation, and uh, again the rationale that's delivered in the white paper, and, and of course the toolkit. What? Does that Feel free if you have more questions or would like a follow up to go ahead and type that in the chat. And we'll give them a chance to do that. I have one line. This is a question kind of as a follow up to the one um, we had earlier about the lifetime care of the animals. Um, they've asked Can you deal with the lifetime care costs as a board designated special purpose reserve? In essence, create a lifetime endowment for each animal that could also be addressed through donor designated. That sounds like an excellent idea. Um, I, again, I would like to see that in addition to a focus on decorating reserves, um, but I, I, that is a perfect example of how a, a special purpose reserve should be customized to the specific organization's needs. And that sounds prime candidate to me. I know I just wanted to mention um, Patty from GFAS just hit in when you were talking about, you know, how to talk to directors about the importance of operating reserves and, you know, in the question from before, before Patty typed in, also, group need um, reserves for accreditation and funders love it. So, I want to pass that along also. Yes, and we have is the fact that funders really are coming around to the fact that you don't have to be a poor, struggling organization to deserve their funding. In fact, quite the reverse, they want to invest in growing concerns. And you know, it's you, you are a business. You are not for-profit business, but no one would question a business owner needing to have working capital and have reserves. Uh, so. You know that's the language that we sometimes need to use to convince um, donors, but they're coming around. Thank you. Um, another question I had from somebody who works with um, our with equine groups. We have two scenarios that they're not sure how to advise these groups about. 
Um, if they have large amounts of pasture, they do have a large hay budget, but if they have a disaster, they could lose their entire source of hay. So how should they reserve in that eventuality? Do you want to do that and then I'll read the second, or do you want to go ahead and read the second? I, I'm not sure if if they're asking me for a dollar amount. Um, I, I'm certainly not qualified to give that, but uh, again, I, I think if they t played out that very scenario, and how much would they need in order to meet the needs of their animals? Uh, so pay is X amount, and they would need, if lost everything, they'd need X amount of dollars to replace X amount of pay for X amount of time. So it's, it's sort of playing out those scenarios and saying, gosh, if this happens, we'd need this much, and if that happens, we'd need this much again, um, and the risks of those happening. Uh, so, so it's out all those what if scenarios and coming up with <laughs> an insurance, an internal insurance amount, an internal reserve to cover that um, should should that happen. And if it is volatile, and if this has happened before, and you, or if it's more and more likely to happen, you would want to drive that, that number higher. I don't know, Janine, did you want to jump in on the phone um, if you're muted and kind of if you want follow up, I know you to type something in that, but if you want to jump in on the phone, can you follow up? Yep, I should. Yeah, I get it was my question, the second part of that question was really similar in that if they purchase their whole hay quantity, which is probably their largest expense for the year, and we're storing it, for the most part, they have cash equivalents that make me feel pretty comfortable. But at the same time, there's always that potential for some kind of disaster, something bad to happen. So I don't, don't know if I should be advising them to have an equivalent of the entire amount as this insurance policy, or maybe just half of it, and then they would have to scramble you know, for the other half, or maybe half the year has already gone by when this disaster happens. I just don't know how much to um, let the fact that they have these cash equivalents be part of their reserve or whether they need to then still have the cash reserve in case something happens to this really important commodity that they have. By cash equivalents, you mean um, investments? Well, no, they have, they've expended, or because they have this pasture, that's their largest budget item for the entire year. So, in essence, they've already secured that item. So, I would necessarily, the twelfth of their expenses, they have 12 twelfths of that, of that, that item covered. So, in the past, I've felt comfortable, okay, so they have their hay, they have their largest item, so I'll just look at everything else that they need to spend for the year minus that and have have the reserves based on everything else. But then I started thinking, what happens if they have a disaster and they lose that? Then they're really vulnerable. So uh, I might not be using the right technical term, but I just want to make sure that I don't encourage something that still leaves them vulnerable. Understood. Um, and I'm not sure that, uh, again, going to depend on what the heads around the table, I mean, I don't think that you should feel that you need to decide this all by yourself. I, mm -hmm. I think playing out scenarios and saying, just said, okay, what if it only happens halfway through the year? What if it happens a third of the way through the year? What And and really, what are the likelihoods of this? And Or you just say, here, we are going to fund this one year in advance, and we're just going to put that much aside. Um, mm, that's a that's a that's a really safe good idea. Uh, and and the other piece of it is, is any of it actually covered by a normal like commercial line of of, of insurance? Uh, it, I've had one group tell me they insure their hay, but they're the only ones that I've ever heard do that. So that might be another good way for me to look into. Um, Maybe there's some you know, combination just, of right. Cover actually with an op, a piece of the operating reserve 
and partly with the risk management piece with the insurance companies. Thank you. This has been one of my biggest in discussion with groups, so thank you very much. You're welcome. You, and I have one more question for you, Beth. Um, I had someone ask, if you have a financial crisis and have to dip into reserves, what is considered an appropriate length of time for rebuilding the reserves? Uh, it, 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 it really is one of those things that you establish during the annual policy making. Uh, groups have it so, the management of their reserves so narrow that they don't permit use of it unless they're is a receivable as collateral uh, so that they know exactly when it's going to be replaced. Um, some organizations say that they sh it, it should be replaced within the n subsequent months, within the subsequent 90 days, uh, and it, it, really, it can be in um, stages of magnitude, so you could take out so if your reserve was, say, $100,000, you could give the managing director or the executive director the, the way to dip into and out of it on a routine basis up to $10,000 or up to being a, repl a replace it within 90 days. But if it's more than $10,000 and it's likely to be more, 90, more than 90 days, then the he has to get permission and make a whole plan about when it, when it can be replaced. And in some instances, that may, if it's a you know, terrible emergency, you know, the whole reserve could be wiped out or half the reserve could be wiped out. And, and then the organization needs to go back to their whole budgeting process and say, okay, we, we need to store this to our target amount. How long is that going to take? And what are our fundraising strategies around that? So may take a couple of years to recover. So not being too, too explicit about that in policy and maybe saying that the that you've established the reserve target is this. Once it's reached, the objective is to keep it there. And if it has to be used, um, the principle is that it be replaced as soon as practicable. With that saying, it has to be replaced in or six months or 12 months because if it's an emergency, the likelihood of actually being able to do it in that short an, an amount of time would just be impossible. Does that make sense? Again, it's a it's an it depends answer, and I'm sorry that's <laughs> the short <laughs> for flexibility. And you know what they have to work with, and what their environment is, is so different that I would be absolutely remiss in selling out something rigid to you. It makes sense, and thank you. So, excuse me. I appreciate um, you taking time to answer these questions. I think that's it. I haven't gotten any more. So okay, I'll pass this over to Jackie if she's got any final comments too. But I want to say a huge thank you, everybody, for attending. And also to you, Beth, for a great presentation. Um, and I'll pass this back over to Aki in case she has any closing comments she'd like to make also. And um, I just want to say thank you to Beth. This has been so much information. I think after this webinar, our participants are going to have so much to look at with your um, presentation itself and documents and documents on the NORI website. There's just so many use practical tools. And I think as Beth emphasized, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's something that really needs to be looked at what's best for your organization. And I'm sure we'll be having follow-up talks about that. So thank you so much for your time um, and for vacation to this is an issue for nonprofits. And we will send out a, um, a survey to participants on SurveyMonkey, just getting your feedback and any follow-up questions you have on the issue. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present. And I, I would like to reiterate that if anyone in using the tools has any suggestions or hit any road bumps or even would like any comments from me, I'm, I'm just, you know, my, my is there, and please feel free to, to shoot mine or 
even send me a draft of your policy and say, do you have any comments, and I'll be glad to do that. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for attending, and thank you, Beth. We will get everybody information about you know where all the documents are if you didn't get them and the recording, um, if not later today, tomorrow. So thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.